on Power Talk AM 1460 and FM 101.1. Streaming worldwide on iHeartRadio. Jan Price talks to the movers and shakers in the film business. The Jan Price Show. You are listening to The Jam Price Show, and my guest today is Gail Friedman, who is the director-producer of a brand-new documentary entitled Hot to Trot. Welcome, Gail. Thank you so much, Jan. I'm pleased to be here. Oh, I'm, I'm so happy to have you on the show, too. Uh, I want to find out a little bit. I always like to find out about everyone's background, you know, how you got involved in this crazy business. And you have a really interesting resume also. So tell me a little bit of how you got into this and some of the things that you've done. How I got into the business, you mean? Yes. Ah, well, it was um, remarkably unplanned, in point of fact. Um, I was headed down a um, several different paths prior to that and uh, ended up uh, working at CBS News uh, at 60 Minutes when it was in wow. the process of being a top-rated show, uh, and then worked at ABC at 2020, um, and, you know, spent almost a decade in the network news divisions and had invaluable experience and learned a lot and enjoyed it, and as I like to say, I was there for the, ta- the tail end of the good old days. But I realized that I really was interested in long-form work, um, documentary style work and the networks were moving away from that at precisely that time uh, so I decided to take the big bold leap and go out on my own uh, and I've been doing that ever since so I've been making uh, documentaries for over 20 years now it's scary to think <laughs> Interesting. So your uh, experience working in the newsroom must have been very beneficial for you transitioning into making documentaries. I think it was uh, incredibly valuable and incredibly essential. It's not necessarily the usual path, and if I were doing it over again, perhaps I would have gone to film school in, instead. But I think the journalism background really um, keeps you honest uh, mm-hmm. makes you, if you pay attention, a crackerjack researcher uh, and a good interviewer, hopefully. Uh, and I think that the research and the interviewing skills really are incredibly important underpinnings to making films. And, and I, you know, I just, I grew up there. I made contacts. I saw all kinds of things and people in the world. I covered all kinds of stories. And I think that I could not be where I am now had I not done that. Again, there's a different path, and I could have taken a different path. But for me, I think when I started out, it was kind of this um, perhaps idealistic notion that we had back in the day of, you know, making a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, And journalism seemed like a way to do that. And then ultimately, I actually decided that digging in deeper and longer uh, and really doing a very depthful job of exploring sorry, exploring stories, um, was another way of having impact. And I, I've never looked back. That's I've been very fortunate that I've been able to, uh, you know, more or less support myself as a working filmmaker. And, you know, that's a gift. I don't take that for granted. That is a gift. <laughs> You're not a starving artist. <laughs> well, sometimes close, but no. <laughs> that's good. I'm happy to hear that. So what was your first documentary that you did? Oh, my very first documentary um, was for public television. I've done a lot of work um, for PBS over the years, and it was about education. I've actually done a couple of films about education. This was uh, a primetime special, and it was about uh, primary school education, which had not been covered very much at the time. You'd hear a lot about high schools and failing schools, but not a lot had been done at that point about uh, early education. And so the premise, this was a two-hour special, and the premise behind it was that we were going to look in depth uh, at four schools that were regionally and demographically incredibly diverse uh, and didn't have a lot of um, well-heeled parents in fast-track communities, but that were succeeding against, seemingly against all odds, and sort of really digging in on what enabled them to do that and thinking that there were, you know, larger lessons to be gleaned from that. So that was the very first documentary I did. And how long was that process of creating that documentary? Oh, gosh. Am I going to remember how long that process was? Um, 
seems like nothing compared to how long Hot to Trot took. I think we had, I'm trying to remember how long it took. I would say five or six months max because it had to air. We had a delivery date. It was airing in September, as documentaries about education often do. And we had to back up the delivery date. Yes, yeah, so I'd say five or six months total. Wow, that's which nothing. was not, no, not really. I mean, compared to news, it seemed like a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. And I had a fellow producer director on it. So we were, you know, we were both working on it. It wasn't all on me. Um, and we had a support team. But as I say, compared to the five years it took me to finish Hot to Trot, mm-hmm. <laughs> it seems like nothing now. Yeah. I know. Here's, uh, you know, I have a lot of documentarians on the show, and it's always amazing how many years, because it's always years that it yep. took to put the documentary together. And I think five seems to be an average but i've is heard that right yeah i've heard more like you know eight and ten years for some which is interesting but five seems to be about an average for a documentary which i find that's very interesting too that it takes so long to put them together obviously well but, that makes me feel better actually <laughs> good <laughs> i'm happy i made you feel better today gail <laughs> well along the way i mean I, you know you run into people who aren't in the business but who you know and they'll say what are you working on now? And I said, well, I'm still working on my film. And they said, oh, my God, you're still working on that? <laughs> <laughs> and I was doing other jobs at the same time. I, I, one of the things that I often do is I make short films for foundations and not-for-profit organizations, and that helps fund my labors of love. And mm-hmm. so along the way, while making Hot to Trot, I made several other films, um, shorter films for, for clients. So it was, um, yeah, I think, you know, it's, you don't go into documentary filmmaking uh, because you think it's going to be lucrative. It has to be a real passion and a labor of love, I think. That's what I was going to say. I mean, everyone that I talk to that, as I said, I've had many, many documentarians on the show, and they're all just very, very, well, everybody I have on the show is very passionate about what they do. I think when, you, when you're when you giving your heart and soul to this business, you know, trying to put together a documentary or an independent film, uh, in order for you to survive that process, because it does take a long time, you've got to be passionate about it to keep yourself, you know, motivated at all times to do it. And that's why I love what I do because I talk to passionate people and I think that's the key to life is having passion. Absolutely. And I think that we're we're um, mutually blessed in that we in a sense we're getting paid to get an education. We're allowed to dip into other people's world and their reality in a in a way that we wouldn't necessarily otherwise. And again I think that's that's a privilege. Um, I'm sure you relate to that, and mm-hmm. and one yes. that I take very seriously. Uh, I mean, you're again. I think the journalism background ties in here for me too. There is, um, I mean, and especially in these days when we hear all of these sort of claims of fake news all I the know. time, I think that there's a real um, a real sense of respect and integrity I learned early on about being fair which doesn't always mean, you know, um, being kind or or taking a position, but it does mean being fair and taking that responsibility very seriously. Very important to be able to do that. And I don't know what's going on in today's world. You know, it just seems like everything is just... Everything seems to be it's crumbling around our ears right now. <laughs> all of our, Indeed. all of the things that we have uh, become accustomed to, and our quality of life, and whatever, I, everything's sort of in motion, and you know, nothing seems the same at the moment. So it's interesting time to be around on the planet. You know, at this well, point. Well, absolutely, and and um, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm I'm perhaps jumping ahead, and feel free to pull me back. But go right ahead. Hot to Trot is, um, at heart, it's an optimistic film. I mm-hmm. mean, there obviously our characters have uh, struggles and there's pathos, but at heart it's an optimistic film. And in a way, when I started, and it was originally six years ago when I really completely began, we've spent the past year on the festival circuit, but um, I was worried that I was out of step with the time, is that, you know, most or many of the films I'd made in the past had been about, you know, serious or um, more tragic or gloomy kinds of subjects, and, and which was part of the attraction to me if I had to try. And now, as it's turned out, sadly for us and the world, 
there's there's so much um, despair, there's so much rage, there's so much turmoil that I think that people are are kind of desperate for um, hopefulness uh, and positivity. And so I feel like we're actually being released at a time when we're we're in tune with the zeitgeist. When I was worried about the opposite uh, before, but that we we need something to feel hopeful and positive about. Um, and I think that the characters in my film are, um, for me, the best possible argument for um, many of our values and ideals and, and aspirations. I agree. I definitely agree. And your movie does do that. We're going to be right back after these quick commercial breaks, and we're going to talk more about Hot to Trot. You have been listening to The Jam Bright Show, all about movies on Power Talk 1460 and 101 FM. Like The Jam Price Show on Facebook, and check out thejampriceshow.com. The Ozio Theater in downtown Monterey is now open every day, showing independent and foreign films. The Ozio Theater has new concession offerings, including beer, wine, hard cider, and their homemade lush slush. You can now schedule private event screenings for community charity events, birthdays, anniversaries, or just a fun gathering of friends. For more information, visit the Ozio Theater online at oziotheater.com. Tired of looking at your worn wood floors? Mr. Sandless can bring them back to life again. That's right. It's Mr. Sandless, the no-sanding solution to beautiful wood floors. Mr. Sandless is clean, efficient, contains no harmful chemicals, and is certified green. Mr. Sandless refinishes all hardwoods, softwoods, engineered flooring, and laminates. Most jobs are completed in one day with no cleanup required ever, with virtually no odor, and is safe for pets and kids. No need to move out or even leave the house. Mr. Sandless is the company that invented Sandless Refinishing and is the largest floor refinishing company in the world. Over 120,000 happy customers, guaranteed adhesion, guaranteed satisfaction, and a five-year warranty. Call Mr. Sandless today at 831-747-7476. That's 747-7476 or mrsandless.com. That's mrsandless.com. On Power Talk AM 1460 and FM 101.1, streaming worldwide on iHeartRadio. Jan Price talks to the movers and shakers in the film business. The Jan Price Show. We are back, and my guest today is director producer Gail Friedman, and we're talking about her brand new documentary, Hot to Trot. Gail, so the listeners have an idea of what we're talking about. Why don't you give the background of, uh, of Hot to Trot? Hot to Trot is a feature-length documentary that takes place inside the fascinating uh, but rather little-known world of same-sex competitive ballroom dance. It's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes, it is. (laughs) A moment to wrap one's brain around it. Uh, But, you know, as we know, ballroom dance uh, in general is enjoying this incredible renaissance um, in the U.S. and all over the world. But... This variant of it, um, with same-sex dance couples, is not very commonly known. And in fact, the mainstream dance world uh, in America uh, has rules that explicitly forbid same-sex couples from competing together. And so uh, they have developed this whole alternative circuit. And I learned about this and was just fascinated. I think initially... What drew me to it was that it was it was gorgeous. It was fascinating. Uh, the dance was wonderful. The, the, it was this sort of blend of art and politics. And then, as I as I dug in, uh, I began to see that there were um, there was a lot of texture. There was a lot of nuance. That there were a lot of ways of getting at issues um, while entertaining people, because it is this blend of art and politics and. But the dancers aren't working the issues, they're living the issues. And I, I loved that. Um, and so I began to learn everything that I could about the phenomenon and um, met any number of characters. And in the end, followed um, primarily four people, a male dance couple and a female dance couple, over the course of four years on and off the dance floor. And each one of them has 
uh, a really compelling backstory in their lives in addition to being um, champions on the dance floor. How did you choose uh, these couples? Well, you know, was the process of casting in a documentary is perhaps um, the single most important decision that you can make, if, one, if there is one single decision. And so initially, uh, I went to a comp in California, where, which is where once a year the largest um, same-sex competition in North America takes place. It's called April Follies, and it takes place in the Bay Area uh, at the end of every April. And I met um, I met a number of, of wonderful dancers and very interesting people. And the the female dance couple I met that day, Emily and Kieran, uh, remain stars in the film. And I think I knew even that day that that was likely. The the camera loved them. They were very comfortable with the process. And even in one my initial um, meeting with them, I learned that Emily. Uh, is a severe, lifelong type 1 diabetic, diagnosed when she was three years old. And her diabetes is so um, severe that she wears an implanted insulin pump 24-7. Amazing. um, Even while she's competing. Uh, Otherwise, she'd be injecting herself 12, 15, 20 times a day. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it's a pretty amazing story. And and dance is literally um, life-preserving for her because exercise extremely important for people with diabetes and she has the most extraordinary attitude so she, I, I met her the, the first day I was shooting actually when I was really on a fishing expedition at that point and just kind of learning my way and her dance partner Kieran who is from New Zealand grew up in a strict conservative military family her father basically ran the New Zealand military and she always felt as like the proverbial um, square peg in a round hole, and it took. And her parents became much more liberal. She, she now has a wonderful relationship with them, but it was a real odyssey. And she has grappled with depression and anxiety most of her adult life. And again, she feels like, um, as she says in the film at one point, that um, she was so low in one period that dance really kept her on the planet. So dance is transformative in everyone's life, but in each case, in a very different way. So I met them. Um, I met a fabulous male dance couple that day as well. Unfortunately for me, they were about to stop dancing together. So that search took a little longer. I also, I live on the East Coast, so I was, and and Kieran and Emily had been dancing together for several years at that point. So I I wanted a male dance couple, um, and I knew that if they, I the best thing would be to find a couple that were just starting to dance together um, so you could kind of explore the difference and how that relationship evolved because it's a very intense relationship. Um, It's a very, you know, um, they spend 15 or 20 hours a week practicing. It's, um, there's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of struggle. It has to work well. And if I had a couple in New York, I knew that I'd be able to shoot much more often as that new partnership was unfolding. So we, you know, without giving away too much of the film, we we met a wonderful um, man, Ernesto, in New York. Uh, when we first met him, he didn't have a dance partner, and then he got a dance partner, and we started, indeed, documenting that relationship. And then something very dramatic happened to Ernesto's dance partner, Robbie. Uh, and it was a major life-threatening health crisis while we were um, beginning our film. And... He, had, he went back to Europe. He was hungry, and he had to go back to Europe for his health care and to be with his family. And so then it was, again, casting about. Um, eventually, um, some months later, Ernesto uh, convinced another... We have, in, we'll get to this. We have a lot of immigrants in our film. Um, a wonderful Russian man named Nikolai, who had been dancing since he was about um, 10 years old, but had never danced with women. And he was a champion dancer. Uh, he had actually um, married his first dance partner when he was quite young, and they came from Russia to America together. Uh, and when we first met him, he was, I think in many ways, still struggling with his identity. Uh, and Ernesto convinced him to give this dance partnership a try. And 
I, I should add that all of these dancers, in addition to the competitions that happen around the year in different cities all around the country and the world, that every four years, the big enchilada in the comp world is um, the gay games. The gay games are like the Olympics of the same-sex world. They're every four years in a different city around the world, and they have all the usual sports. But dance, um, both standard ballroom and Latin, are also considered competitive sports in the gay games. And the dancers come from several hundred countries all over the world and compete. So that is the ultimate competition. And so when we started filming in 2012, one of the ideas was that we would follow our characters up through the 2014 gay games. And in point of fact, we ended up going beyond that point um, for at least another um, year plus before we finished filming. But that was kind of the construct that, that we began with. Um, and Ernesto and Nikolai indeed um, went to the gay games, as did Emily and Kieran, with many life events along the way, right. most of them unforeseen <laughs> by them and us. <laughs> so how was the process of filming this? Because you're also, you know, you're filming their personal lives as well as their dancing lives. So how was that process for everyone? Well, of course, I suppose... Um, They'd be better equipped to answer that in some ways than I would, although as we've been on the festival circuit, people have asked them that often, you know, because they expose um, a lot of vulnerability and a lot of fragility and a lot of aspects of themselves that um, there they are on the big screen for the world to see. And, you know, I guess I'm not sure that that always dawned on them in the middle of the filming process, you know. I mean, of course, they knew I was there making a film, but, you know, in many cases, from the time we did an interview till the film was finished, I think they forgot some of what they said. Um, and they got very used to me after a while, right? I was around for all these years, <laughs> and we got to know each other very well. I think, I think they felt very, I mean, again, speaking for them, which I'm loath to do, but I've, I've heard them talk about this. I think that they were... They were um, gratified that I was making a film that took place in this world that they're so passionate about, and that I clearly uh, was serious about that and kept, kept coming back and insisting I wanted to finish this film. So they appreciated that. I think they came to trust um, that I would uh, be fair and that I honored their life stories, um, and that although they couldn't control the narrative that I would um, do right by them and present them in, in a reasonable um, way with, you know, the ups and downs and everything in between. But it was intense. I mean, I was around for some of their very difficult times and also for some of their very joyful times. And, you know, a relationship formed. Uh, and, you know, I think I decided early on I couldn't, once I had decided on my characters and that they each were going um, to be um, compelling enough to feature in a film, then I had to say, okay, well, I'm just going to go on this journey with them and wherever it goes, it goes. And I'm not going to impose a structure on the story in advance. I can't. I don't know what's going to happen. And so many things did happen along the way. And I think it's, um, it was interesting to watch each of them see the film the first time that they did. There were um, there were a lot of tears. I don't not not upset or sad tears, just very emotional tears. Um, and then also a lot of laughter uh, and a lot of I think feeling proud. Um, but a lot a lot of emotion. Um, you know, I and I and I know that several of them have said to me that when they've seen the, the film on subsequent viewings then they're able to focus a little bit more on everybody else in the film. But, of course, the first time, imagine what it's like if you were featured and there you are suddenly sort of seeing yourself under a microscope. The first time you watch the film, you're probably busy assessing, how do I sound? How do I look? Is that my best? And after that, they're able to kind of relax and enjoy the film as a whole more. But I think it's, it's been a very significant event in their lives. I mean, Nikolai often says to me, this just... This was just a gift that fell in my lap. Oh. And, you know, that makes me, of course, feel quite wonderful and yes. gratified that he sees it that way. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, we'll we'll get back to this uh, line. I'm going to have more, many more questions in in, in line with uh, what we were just talking about after these brief messages. You are listening to the Jam Price Show, all about movies on Power Talk 1460 and 101 FM. Like the Jam Price Show on Facebook and check out thejampriceshow.com. Have you ever dreamed of doing commercials or movies? Your dream starts with a desire. And if you have a desire to do commercials and feature films, we want to know about you. We're Moco Film, one of the Genesis companies that includes Voice Jock, a major provider of TV commercial talent to TV stations throughout the nation. Registering is free. Just go to mocofilm.com and fill out the information. That's M-O-C-O film.com. You'll become part of a large talent bank available to producers. Go to mocofilm.com today and start living your dream. The Century Theater at Northridge Mall is newly remodeled with luxury loungers in every auditorium. Oversized plush recliners are electric-powered reclining seats with extendable footrests, cup holders, and snack tables. Guaranteed comfort with all reserved seating. Reserve the best seat in town online at Cinemark.com or download the Cinemark app today. The Century Theater at Northridge Mall is newly remodeled. On Power Talk AM 1460 and FM 101.1, streaming worldwide on iHeartRadio. Jan Price talks to the movers and shakers in the film business. The Jan Price Show. We are back, and my guest today is director producer Gail Friedman, and we're talking about her new documentary, Hot to Trot. So I can imagine that they felt very naked after, you know, with watching themselves on the screen and there had to be a lot of trust with you as uh, the director of of this um so what was that process like to build up that kind of trust so they were able to expose mm-hmm. more of themselves in the film which is really very palpable thank you um it was a process and they did have to decide um that they were going to trust me um and I, you know, as with any relationship, I think that builds over time. I mean, they're fairly open people. Um, Nikolai's perhaps a little bit more reserved at first. And yet, interestingly, um, the first time I actually sat down and interviewed Nikolai, I thought of it as, okay, we're getting our feet wet, right? I'm, I'm getting to know you. We're just going to begin to explore a little bit. I didn't expect that first interview necessarily go very deep and in point of fact we ended up sitting there and shooting for several hours and I learned an enormous about about Nikolai and his relationship with his father which um, had not been an easy one uh, and his history with his mother and the fact that he didn't come out till he was about 30 years old and and it was a tremendously open conversation and I saw him about a week later we were shooting um, uh, a costume fitting. It was such, something much less, you know, personally revealing, except of his body, perhaps. <laughs> and, he, and he said, he's very, he's a very thoughtful person, and you know, you can, you, he's done a lot of psychological work on himself, and, he, and and it shows. And he said, you know, it was so interesting. He he teaches dance, and he has a very successful practice. And in a way, a dance teacher. Um, is a therapist in a sense, right? I mean, his students come to him, and the, 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 doing dance is a very um, a very committed endeavor. And so he has students he works with. Uh, they'll take three hour long lessons a week, and they end up talking about themselves and their issues. And he said, "I'm so used to listening to others and taking in their needs and their stories." And he said, "It was amazing to sit there, and you just wanted to listen to me." <laughs> mm. And I, so I think we all have that need to be seen, to be heard, to be acknowledged. Yes. And, and I, so I think that there was that which helped, that I was obviously, and they could tell, that I was genuinely um, interested in a very full way who they are and what their experience has been and what makes them tick, what they care about, and what their struggles have been. Um, and, you know, I think if, if that authenticity exists, People can tell. They know that. Uh, and also, I kept coming back. <laughs> 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 there had been a few other people who had started out trying to make films inside the world of same-sex oh, dance. Because oh, really? it is, yep, there had been several other people. Um, and they had not finished. 
So some of the dancers had kind of been exposed to this before, particularly Emmy and Emily and Kieran. They said, yeah, yeah, we've had a few other filmmakers who have shown up, and they would shoot a little while, and then they would kind of disappear, and either because they couldn't find the funding or they were daunted by the notion of the, um, the music rights, because obviously there's a lot of music in the film, or they just lost their mojo or what, whatever took place. And so the fact that I... They, they didn't know if I would finish or not, but at some point, I guess they thought, "Well, here she is again." So, she she must be the real deal. But it was it was a process for sure um, to establish a mutual trust, really. Uh, and I'm I'm very grateful that they let me into their lives in the way that they have. And you know, we all still know each other. <laughs> so, oh, that's nice. Yeah. yeah. When did you finish um, shooting this? I finished shooting uh, at the beginning of uh, 2016, early 2016, uh, and then started editing like in, in the middle of that year. Finished editing um, in um, the middle of 2017, and we started on the festival circuit a year last summer, a year ago. Uh, June of 2017 was our was our first festival. So it's. Um, now it's actually six years from when I began. Wow, yeah. It, time flies, doesn't it? <laughs> when, yeah. When we're having fun. <laughs> it definitely does. So how has the, uh, how has it been, you said you, you were explaining a little bit about their emotions of watching themselves on the screen, but how has the reaction been overall at the various film festivals that you've gone to and shown this wonderful film? It's been so gratifying, Jan. Uh, we've had... Um, and we've had mixed audiences. We've shown at several LGBTQ film festivals. We've shown at documentary festivals. Um, so we've had a real range of um, audiences. And, you know, it, you don't, you know, we talk about this all the time. You don't have to love dance to enjoy the film. You don't have to be gay to enjoy the film. Those no. are obviously are natural affinities. But what we've really found, I'm happy to say, is that, um, and I think it's a testament to the characters, that audiences really respond, um, that they get completely caught up. And it is, it is at heart a character um, piece yes. and a real character study and, and, I hope, a kind of um, an idiosyncratic attack on bigotry without hitting people over the head with that. And, it, and we've had just really wonderful responses. I mean, um, at last fall in New York at Newfest, we won the Audience Award, which was a wonderful surprise. Uh, we've had sold-out screenings um, at most of our uh, festivals that we've done. Uh, and now, having been picked up for distribution and um, scheduled uh, for bookings in New York and L.A., and then, as they say, select cities nationwide, it's, it's really gratifying. Because on one level, you could say it's this little niche film, and it is, but it it seems, again, I think... I, I feel like the times are such that it really is speaking to people, uh, and and that's that's really wonderful. I mean, what I want now is just to put it out there in the world, be able to share it, um, and and give it a life of its own. Well, it's a beautiful film, and people should see it. And, and again, yeah, you know, very timely with everything that's going on right now ah. with the LGBTQ community as we speak. Uh, every day, there's something new that's you know coming out that wants to take away the rights yep. that we we've given them these rights as you know human beings on the planet. Whatever your religious or political views are, they are people, and we are all one and so even today there was something else that came out about trying to take more of the rights away from them i just find this deplorable so your film is very timely to shine a light on this issue again in a in a, in, in a different way you know not absolutely you know and, but and those of us who live on the two coasts perhaps take some degree of progressivism for granted yes um but and we shouldn't because even no. in new york and california um there are certainly pockets of intolerance. Uh, but I think this is one of the civil rights issues of our time. And I mentioned before, this wasn't something out, something that I started out thinking was an important theme of the film, but it became so, which is 
the whole immigration issue. And mm, that yes. is certainly timely at the yes. moment, uh, uh, more so than any of us would perhaps ever have wanted to be true. Uh, but as it turns out, um, our film is filled with immigrants from yes. Hungary, from Kazakhstan, from Uzbekistan, from New Zealand, from Costa Rica. And the people comment on that in screenings all the time. And that became a very important theme of the film. And, uh, you know, they're all Americans, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or just people, again, human beings yes. <laughs> on the planet, you know. <laughs> you know, again, I think when we start putting all these labels on everything, maybe that's what separates us. Maybe we should stop putting the labels out there. Absolutely. You know, I think that would make us feel more integrated and less segregated on all levels, even as as women. To say that, you know, putting Absolutely. the label that we're a woman because of all the issues that have, you know, uh, certainly we've been oppressed, too, throughout history and, uh, you know, and continue to be. But, you know, again, it's these labels. And so if I think we start to encompass and embrace that we are all just one and we're all just human beings on the planet trying to do the best job we can do at this stage. And your film, you know, your film in a way does highlight that, too. So Absolutely. Thank you. you. No, I appreciate that because I, I think that's right. I think that, you know, there is a universal dimension here. I mean, we all have issues of of health and career struggle and family relationships and love relationships and so we can we can all relate to that yes and that we're in a time when it seems as if there's so much um separating of people and so much putting wedges and and rather than finding ways to bring people together it seems that we're in a climate where the opposite is taking place and so i hope in our own small way we can you know swim against that tide I hope so, too. And I think that's why uh, I love documentaries as much as I do, because it it shines the light on so many of these issues that are going on in the world, but hopefully shining a light on our our humanity. Yes, precisely. And I think that's what's so important in in doing a documentary. When you when you decided to do this, what initially attracted you to this subject of uh, well, I had just finished spending um, not quite two years uh, making a very different kind of documentary uh, for the History Channel, uh, and it was about the making of the 9-11 memorial. Yes, I want to talk about that. I do, want, I do want to touch on that. So good. I'm glad you segued into that. Go ahead. <laughs> um, no, thank you. Um, and I don't think that that was a, um, a depressing film, but it clearly was rooted in an enormous tragedy. Right. And so I'd been steeped in that for a couple of years. And when I finished, selfishly, my spirit needed something else. I needed something that was more celebrating life, worth and all, but that would have a very different um, effect on me, frankly. And I didn't know what that was going to be. And then one of my um, primary cameramen, Joel Shapiro, who I've worked with for a number of years, happened to mention that he'd grown up in Philadelphia with a girl who they hadn't seen each other since they were 12 years old, and she ran some kind of same-sex dance group in California. That, that, he, I don't know, he, did, he didn't even know why he told me that. And I can't even tell you to this day, but something in the back of my head just went, oh my goodness, wow. And I said, tell me more about that. And he said, that's it. That's what I know. And I said, well, can you find out more? And he said, no, that's what you do. <laughs> so... <laughs> Put it back, right back on you. <laughs> so I said, well, let your friend know that I'm going to make a phone call to her and learn more about this. And so initially it really was. It was the beauty. It was the joy. It was the lightness. You know, I, I used to do dance. I love dance. Uh, dance is incredibly popular again now. It was just kind of, oh, wow, this is really intriguing. And then, as I say, I got completely, the minute I started to dig in, I got completely caught up in it. And I became obsessed with making this film and getting it done. Uh, and I, again, to this day, I don't know that I can tell you why I became so obsessed. I just knew this was a film um, that I had to finish, and I knew that it was a film for the big screen. I mean, yes, it can stream, and people will be able to watch it at home, but this was not a PBS kind of film. It was, you know, it wasn't a TV film. Mm-hmm, it was meant no. to be something else. And so I just threw myself into it. So what it you know, where it started and what it turned out to be were um, different things. 
interesting when those little seeds get planted. When we come back, we'll talk more about that. You're listening to The Jam Price Show, all about movies on Power Talk 1460 and 101FM. Like The Jam Price Show on Facebook and check out thejampriceshow.com. The Ozio Theater in downtown Monterey is now open every day, showing independent and foreign films. The Ozio Theater has new concession offerings, including beer, wine, hard cider, and their homemade lush slush. You can now schedule private event screenings for community charity events, birthdays, anniversaries, or just a fun gathering of friends. For more information, visit the Ozio Theater online at oziotheater.com. Tired of looking at your worn wood floors? Mr. Sandless can bring them back to life again. That's right. It's Mr. Sandless, the no-sanding solution to beautiful wood floors. Mr. Sandless is clean, efficient, contains no harmful chemicals, and is certified green. Mr. Sandless refinishes all hardwoods, softwoods, engineered flooring, and laminates. Most jobs are completed in one day with no cleanup required ever, with virtually no odor, and is safe for pets and kids. No need to move out or even leave the house. Mr. Sandless is the company that invented Sandless Refinishing and is the largest floor refinishing company in the world. Over 120,000 happy customers, guaranteed adhesion, guaranteed satisfaction, and a five-year warranty. Call Mr. Sandless today at 831-747-7476. That's 747-7476 or mrsandless.com. That's mrsandless.com. On Power Talk AM 1460 and FM 101.1, streaming worldwide on iHeartRadio. Jan Price talks to the movers and shakers in the film business. The Jan Price Show. We are back, and my guest today is director producer Gail Friedman, and we're talking about her award winning documentary, Hot to Trot. Gail, what was the biggest lesson that you learned while making this documentary? Well, you know, I don't know if it was a brand new lesson, but perhaps a reinforcement um, of the value of um, of being committed and being relentless, for lack of another word, uh, in pursuit of of your dreams. And that was something um, that really resonated with each and every one of uh, our characters that I think for me was very meaningful that you know just um transforming yourself and and in a sense rocking the world in the process and that you know you remember that old saw the personal is political um i think that this the process of getting to know our characters and making this film just really drove that home to me again in a way that was um very meaningful to me and that i hope will be to others and also that the the kind of um (laughs) sounds perhaps goofy in a way, but the power of decency. Mm. Uh, and I think, you know, there was there was an article in the New York Times just a couple of weeks ago about um, the unexpected success this summer of, of two documentaries, one about Mr. Rogers right. and the other one about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yes. And yes, they were both celebrities. We don't have celebrities in our film. But part of what the, the piece was about was that their unexpected success partly because we're in unconventional times and people, again, like as I was saying before, really want to uh, reinforce for them that, that kindness and decency and goodness and hopefulness um, aren't corny, but actually have deep meaning. And I think we can all um, use that reminder right now. So if that's a lesson, then, you know, that's what I took away. Right. I, I totally agree with you with both of those documentaries. Interestingly enough, at the Sundance Film Festival, Won't You Be My Neighbor opened the festival. And that's unusual. I don't think, I don't remember them ever opening Sundance with a documentary. Yeah, I think you're right. I, yeah. I, I just don't remember that ever happening. And so that was quite amazing. And then uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was at the festival and she was was the rock star. Everybody wanted to get near her and talk to her and be around her. And again, both of those documentaries were the talk of the festival. And I think, I, I mean, I totally agree with you. There's so much that we, I mean, when I walked out of Won't You Be My Neighbor, I mean, I never knew any of that stuff about, you know, Fred Rogers. Uh, you know, I wasn't that generation that watched him. So, um, it, 
and I didn't really pay that much attention to him. And afterwards, I was like, wow, I wish I had, you know. But I walked out just feeling so good. And I and I, I, I immediately went on Facebook and I just wrote like a quick uh, review for people. Uh, and I said, run, do not walk to go see that movie because you're going to walk out feeling much more compassionate uh, and loving when you walk out of the movie theater. And then the Ruth Bader Ginsburg story is, you know, we, things we just never knew about. That woman's a powerhouse. Oh, absolutely. I mean, to and, go. And yeah. Absolutely. And Unbelievable. True Truly inspiring. Yes. And, and I think that, you know, instead of the kind of um, mean-spiritedness that seems to dominate so much of our national conversation these days, you know, that th- this is the opposite of that. Yes, totally, 100%. Yeah. And we hopefully she stays healthy. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You know. <laughs> very healthy. Yeah, very healthy. <laughs> well, to go back to, you know, some of the film festivals, we started to touch on a little bit, but the audience reaction, what what have been some of the audience's reaction to this film? You've gone to numerous film festivals. Has there been a general reaction or um, it, that you can kind of hone in on, or have there just been a, a lot of different reactions? Oh, I guess both of those are true to some degree. I mean, I'd say the... The common thread is that people, as exactly what we were just talking about, that people say they walk out feeling good. Mm-hmm. They walk out feeling um, sort of small eye inspired. That they um, they feel energized. They do feel um, more hopeful, uh, and that's that's pretty universal. People also tend to universally um, feel very emotional. There's a lot of laughter and tears at most of our screening, uh, and I like both of those. Uh, I mean, it means that people have been touched humanistically, yes, and yes. so that's meaningful. And then, um, at some of the LGBTQ festivals, there's um, there again, there's I mean, people it's, have just thanked me numerous times. Thank you for making this film. Thank you for, you know, taking this story and putting it on the big screen, and a sense of um, of affirmation and pride. And um, the fact that, I mean, we've also obviously had a lot of dancers come to some of our screenings, but the idea that there's a way to merge artistic expression um, with a proud identity. Uh, so that's resonated for audiences. Um, and then just, it's a lot of fun. I mean, the dance is also just gorgeous and fun yes. and, and sexy and, and a complete kick to watch. <laughs> It is. It very much is. There's no question about that. I have a lot of friends who are dancers, so I'm going to, you know, steer them towards this movie for sure. It, it, I didn't even know there was same-sex competition. I mean, I, that's that was all new, too. Uh, is that well widely re- known, or is it just mostly known in the LGBTQ community? I don't think it's widely known even there. I, I was not aware of it until I started making the film. Uh, and that was part of what appealed to me, of course, because we're always, um, you know, we're all looking for something new and relatively unknown uh, because, you know, that's uh, that's part of the goal here. And right. so, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it's, um, I think it's becoming better known. Certainly the whole notion of dance competitions is getting a lot more attention, especially with, you know, Dancing with the Stars and So You Think You Can Dance and all of those shows achieving such popularity. Um, but it is, it is not a widely known phenomenon. I hope that we can begin to change that. Um, I also hope that we can get shows, uh, and Dancing with the Stars in particular, it would be in the, some of their um, other versions internationally, they have allowed same sex couples to compete, but not here. Oh. Interesting. And it would be pretty great if we can help shake that up. Yes, it would be. Yeah. It would be. It would be very interesting to it do actually, that. It actually, yeah. yeah, it really would be. And yeah. I. I think uh, the guys in particular would be most willing to <laughs> to go on the show. <laughs> yes, I'd love to see that. I definitely yeah. would love to see that. No, I get it. When, when I would tell people what I was working on along the way, and again, it's a mouthful, right? I'm making a film inside the world of same-sex competitive ballroom dance, and people would kind of stop for a minute, <laughs> take it in, and then I'd get one of two reactions. Either they'd say, wow, that's really cool, <laughs> or they'd kind of look at me quizzically like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> Interesting. Gail, yeah, where can people see this movie? Well, to begin with, um, we are opening in New York City at the wonderful Quad Cinema um, downtown on August 24th, and we'll be there for a one-week run. 
Um, and then we are opening in Los Angeles uh, on September 14th at um, Lemley's Music Hall, and we'll be there for a week as well. And then we have some other, um, we're doing a special uh, doc night presentation at the Avon Theater in Stamford. Um, we're opening in Lafayette, Louisiana. Um, you know, it'll be select cities nationwide after that, and then ultimately um, will be available for streaming and home entertainment once we um, we finish with our theatrical run. But initially, it's it's New York, the big, the big two, New York and L.A., yeah. which is where you want to start. That's great. Um, and that's that's coming up fast. So yes. we're we're really excited about that. Yeah. It's um, you know, it's it's more than, um, you know, well, not more than, but it's exactly what we might have hoped for from the beginning, and here it is. It's happening. It's exciting, very exciting, and, and I highly recommend everybody go find this documentary, Hot to Trot. We're going to be right back after these brief messages. You're listening to The Jam Price Show, all about movies on Power Talk 1460 and 101 FM. Like The Jam Price Show on Facebook, and check out thejampriceshow.com. Have you ever dreamed of doing commercials or movies? Your dream starts with a desire. And if you have the desire to do commercials and feature films, we want to know about you. We're Moco Film, one of the Genesis companies that includes Voice Jock, a major provider of TV commercial talent to TV stations throughout the nation. Registering is free. Just go to mocofilm.com and fill out the information. That's M-O-C-O-Film.com. You'll become part of a large talent bank available to producers. Go to mocofilm.com today and start living your dream. The Century Theater at Northridge Mall is newly remodeled with luxury loungers in every auditorium. Oversized plush recliners are electric-powered reclining seats with extendable footrests, cup holders, and snack tables. Guaranteed comfort with all reserved seating. Reserve the best seat in town online at Cinemark.com or download the Cinemark app today. The Century Theater at Northridge Mall is newly remodeled. On Power Talk AM 1460 and FM 101.1, streaming worldwide on iHeartRadio. Jan Price talks to the movers and shakers in the film business. The Jan Price Show. We are back, and my guest today is director producer Gail Friedman, and we're talking about her award winning documentary, Hot to Trot. Gail, we only have a couple of minutes left. The time has zipped by here. Uh, I It's I would love to know a little bit more. I do want to talk about uh, the making of the 9-11 Memorial film, because I did watch that uh, oh. when on the 10th anniversary. So I ah, was curious about that. You're welcome. It was, yeah. So how was that? Because you said you that was something that was a little, obviously, more difficult to do. Um, but how was that process for you making that documentary? Well, it was, it was very meaningful. Uh, I, I am a New Yorker, uh, and, you know, we all felt that, but those of us, um, who live in New York, you know, we, we lived with it um, right. very in a very immediate way. And so, and that pit, that open pit that mm. was just a, a scar on the environment for so long. And so when this was about to be transformed, the opportunity to be there um, at the site uh, with the workers, uh, with some of the families, as that became a reality was, again, it was a real privilege. Um, and, you know, we, uh, it was very meaningful. And I and I I feel um, we were able. You can't find something positive in nine eleven, but something no. positive came out of something negative in terms of uh, people. I mean, it seems elusive now, but people unifying um, again in pursuit of a goal. Yes. And um, so it was uh, it was a great opportunity, and I and uh, I feel it, it's beautiful. If people haven't seen the memorial, it's quite beautiful and quite moving. Yeah, I have not seen the memorial itself, but I did go down uh, to Ground Zero three weeks after 9-11. I had to uh-huh. go to fly to New York to do a TV show and uh, went down there. And I can't tell you what it was, you know, you, as you know, you were there. But yeah. uh, for those who only watched it on television and then going actually there and seeing it. And uh, it was it was there were a lot of people uh, that were down the day I was down there. And it was just a quiet reverence that we were all experiencing and people were sharing their stories one was a nurse saying they were expecting a lot of patients and nobody came so the, you know just hearing some of those stories was amazing well gail i want to thank you so much it's been a wonderful having you on the show and i wish you much success with hot to trot go check out that documentary everyone and uh thank you again 
Jay, and thank you so very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Thank you. You have been listening to the Jam Price Show all about movies on Power Talk 1460 and 101 FM. Like the Jam Price Show on Facebook and check out thejampriceshow.com.